What the state can do in such circumstances is only to ensure that the guilty person accepts the punishment. Only with respect to one single category of the law is the enforcement of positive compliance possible, namely liability to taxation. The discharge of this duty can be enforced in the strict sense of the term as can monetary private legal obligations by removing the appropriate value from the liable person by force. Certainly it is true that this compulsion refers only to money payments and not even to economic services of any other kind. If someone is obliged to give a definite contribution in kind, he can never really be coerced into delivering it if he does not wish, under any circumstances, to produce it. However, something else that he owns can be taken away from him and transferred into money. For any such object has a money value and can replace the other in this relationship, even though perhaps it can do so in no other. The despotic constitution that aims at the unconditional compulsion of subordinates should probably, for reasons of expediency, request only money payments from them right from the outset. In relation to the demand for money, there is nothing like the resistance that may develop on the occasion of a claim for other contributions that are impossible to enforce. It is therefore internally and externally useful to reduce claims that may meet any kind of resistance solely to money. Perhaps this is one of the more basic reasons why, in general, the despotic regime is often associated with the promotion of the money economy, the Italian despots, for example, usually tended to sell their domains, and why the mercantilist system, with its greatly increased evaluation of money, developed at the time of unlimited monarchical power. Of all demands, the demand for money is the demand whose fulfillment is the least dependent on the goodwill of the obligated person. In contrast, that freedom which exists with reference to all other demands and whose substantiation and confirmation depends only upon the willingness to resist declines. This in no way contradicts the fact strongly underlined earlier that the conversion of contributions in kind into money payments usually implies a liberation of the individual. For the shrewd despot will always choose a form for his demands that grants to his subjects the greatest possible freedom in their purely individual relationships. The terrible tyrannies of the Italian Renaissance are, at the same time, the ideal breeding ground for the most unrestricted growth of the individual with his ideal and private interests. And at all times, from the Roman Empire to Napoleon III, political despotism has been found to be accompanied by a licentious private libertinism. For its own benefit, despotism will restrict its demands to what is essential for it and will make its measure and kind endurable by granting the greatest possible freedom for everything else. The demand for money payments unites the two viewpoints in the most practical way possible. The freedom that is granted in purely private affairs in no way prohibits the disfranchisement in the political sphere which it has so often achieved. The transformation of substantive values into money values alongside this type of instance in which the monetary discharge of obligations corresponds to a degradation of the obligated person, there stands a second supplementation of the results analyzed in the last chapter. We have seen what progress it meant for the serf if he could discharge his obligations by money payments. The opposite result occurs for him when the change in his relationship to money is instigated by the other party that is when the lord of the manor buys from him the piece of land which he hitherto possessed with more or less extended rights. The grounds for the prohibitions issued in the 18th century and far into the 19th in the area of the old German empire against the buying out of the peasant are, it is true, basically associated with fiscal or very general agricultural policy. Yet occasionally the sentiment seems to have prevailed that it was unjust to the peasant if land was taken away from him even in exchange for a very fair monetary compensation. Certainly it is possible to experience the transformation of a tangible possession into money as liberation. With the aid of money, we can convert the value of the object that was hitherto fixed in one form into any other, with money in our pocket we are free, whereas previously the object made us dependent upon the conditions for its conservation and realization. In principle, obligation to an object seems to be no different from the obligations to a person, for the object determines our activities no less rigidly than does a person if we want to avoid the worst consequences. Only the reduction of the whole relationship to money, whether we receive it or give it away, releases us from the determination that comes to us from something outside ourselves. So it is true that the frequent conversion of obligations into money payments in the 18th century gave to the peasants a monetary freedom. Yet such conversions took away from him what cannot be bought by money and what primarily gives freedom its value, the trustworthy object of personal activity. 
To the peasant, the land meant something altogether different from a mere property value, for him it meant the possibility of useful activity, a center of interest, a value that determined his life, which he lost as soon as he owned only the money value of his land instead of the land itself. The reduction of his landed property to its mere money value pushes him on the road to proletarianization. A different level of agricultural social relations exhibits the same form of development. On the farms in Oldenburg, for example, the hired labor relationship often prevails. The hired laborer is obliged to work a certain number of days per year for a lower wage than the day wage laborer, in exchange, he receives from the farmer his dwelling, use of land, transport, etc., for less than the going price. This is, at least in part, an exchange of values in kind. It has been pointed out that this relationship is characterized by social equality of the farmer and the hireling, who does not feel inferior by being forced to work for wages on account of less favorable property conditions. At the same time, however, it has been stated that the emerging money economy destroys this relationship, and that the transformation of the natural exchange of services into money payments degrades the hireling even though he would, in this way, gain a certain freedom of action concerning his work contract, in contrast to being restricted to receiving a definite amount of goods. In the same area, the same development is evident in another respect. As long as the threshers on the farms were paid by a certain share of the threshing they had a lively personal interest in their master's successful management of the farm. The threshing machine displaced this type of payment, and the money wage that replaced it does not favor a personal relationship between master and laborer, who gained more self-respect and moral support from it than from a higher cash income the negative meaning of freedom and the extirpation of the personality money's importance in gaining individual freedom serves to illustrate a very far-reaching definition of the concept of freedom. At first glance, freedom seems to possess a merely negative character. It only has meaning in contrast to a form of bondage, it is always freedom from something and corresponds to the concept by expressing the absence of obstacles. However, the concept of freedom is not confined to this negative meaning. Freedom would be without meaning and value if the casting off of commitments were not, at the same time, supplemented by a gain in possessions or power, freedom from something implies, at the same time, freedom to do something. Phenomena in many varied spheres confirm this. In political life, wherever a party demands or attains freedom the issue is not at all one of freedom as such, but those positive gains, increases and spreading of power from which the party was previously excluded. The importance of the freedom which the French Revolution gave to the third estate was that a fourth estate was in the making which could now be required to work freely for that estate. The freedom of the church means the direct extension of its sphere of influence, for example, that with reference to its freedom of instruction the state permits its citizens to be exposed to and influenced by the church's suggestions. The liberation of the peasant serfs all over Europe was followed up by endeavors to make the peasant the owner of his plot of land, just like the ancient Jewish regulations, which requested that the indebted slave had to be liberated after a certain number of years, while adding that he should be handed over some property, preferably that which he formerly owned. Wherever the purely negative sense of freedom operates, Freedom is considered to be incomplete and degrading.